Hey there, Steve from the Fleet Success Show. Wanted to take a second and invite you to attend the Fleet Success Summit, a one-of-a-kind two-day event designed specifically to arm today's fleets with what they need to succeed. We're bringing some of the best speakers from business, technology, leadership, and organization culture to the stage to share with you information that we believe has been withheld from Fleet far too long. If you enjoy this podcast, you're sure to enjoy the Fleet Success Summit. Head to fleetsuccesssummit.com to view our speaker lineup and grab your tickets today. All right, back to the show. Welcome to the Fleet Success Show, a podcast dedicated to talking about the fundamentals, standards, and best practices that empower today's fleets to achieve fleet success. Let's get into the show. All right, welcome back for another episode of the Fleet Success Show. I'm your host, Josh Turley. Joined today by Jeff Jenkins. What up? And Steve Saltzgiver. Good to be here. Hey, glad to have you back. Yeah. Right? Dude, I'm tired, though. Yeah, well, you've been on the road a lot. I'm tired. It's uh, It's been quite the whirlwind week. Um, so today, big, big day for us. Episode number 50. Five oh. Yeah, 50. I don't even remember how to say that in Spanish. What was that? Siete, siete days? I thought it was, <laughs> no. I don't even know what it is. It's a good question. 40, 30, 40, 50. 50 oh. There you go. <laughs> anyway. Don't ask me to speak any Spanish. Uh, I can't even speak to my daughter-in-law. Listen, I'm, in, I'm impressed we hit 50, like, and people are still listening, and we're getting new listeners. It's great. It's, and it's growing, and it keeps going faster. Right? Yeah. We kind of said at the beginning, hey, if we hit five episodes, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, 50 in. Uh, so a big thank you to listeners and everybody who's been uh, faithfully following us so far. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit today, just kind of looking back. You know, it's always fun to reflect, see where you've been uh, as you kind of move to where you're going to go in the future. But it's always fun to reflect and look at some of our past favorite episodes. Uh, so we kind of looked through our episode list and picked out some of the ones that, that we enjoyed. And so, Jeff, I'm going to start with you two of your favorite episodes as you look through and said, yeah, I like, I either enjoyed recording these or like, these were some of my favorite topics. Uh, so there's a lot on there, obviously, because we love this business and what we do. But one is episode 22, speaking the kind truth, um, for lots of different reasons. And I don't, are we going to break these down as we go along? Yeah. Talk about them. Like why, why was that episode okay. uh, fun for you or why did you enjoy that one the most? Well, I enjoyed it because it's such a difficult topic. I think, um, for people to demonstrate when they're in the work environment, it's very hard to have that conflict and to be able to confront somebody in a professional manner and, and and give them that kind truth. When I do interviews or I talk to people, the hardest thing everyone says is the conflict and being willing to address a peer, right? Or if you're a manager being willing to put someone on a performance improvement plan or taking the time to coach them about the things that, that they're missing. And so because of just knowing how difficult that is for a lot of people, I thought that it was one of those ones that hopefully it resonated with a lot of people and they took some tips from it and were able to apply them uh, into their professional lives, even their personal lives. I mean, you can speak the kind truth to anyone. Yeah. I think that, uh, that episode was one of my tops just cause it is, it's one of those things that a lot of us as managers, we want to be nice. We don't be liked. And so we struggle with sometimes, you know, speaking a hard truth. Um, One of our cohorts talked to us about uh, a saying they used often was, you know, we don't, we want to throw hard. We just want to avoid throwing sharp, right? And so they would always say, throw hard, not sharp. Um, You know, throw to make sure you make an impact, but don't throw it at wound or hurt. Yeah. Um, So I was talking to one of our salespeople and we were talking just about wanting to be liked, right? So he was kind of relating the kind truth to the sales cycle Mm -hmm. and how a lot of salespeople specifically, they try so hard to get their prospect to like them and they don't focus enough on the product or gaining that person's trust. And when you speak the kind truth, right, you get more trust with people than you do actually getting them to like you. And if you have the trust in turn, that usually gets you to be liked. Yep. Especially if you do it right. You know, I mean, no one minds if you're spoken the kind truth to, if it's something that you didn't realize you were doing, you know, I mean, you always hear people that say, I want, I want the feedback. Right. You know, I mean, 
Uh, I mean, I we're none of us are perfect. I've always wanted to know if I'm running short somewhere or doing something I shouldn't be doing. Um, but it, it all depends on the tone. Well, it's intent, right? Yes. It all depends on the intent. Yeah. So I don't, I've got a, did I tell the story about when I was working at night transportation and I dropped a load and it wasn't covered? Did I tell that on here at all? I don't, I don't remember so. it. It doesn't sound familiar to me. So I, I had been working for, gosh, it wasn't very long, a few months. And it's all about miles. And what we do is we have drivers that would go to Southern California and back to Phoenix. And if you could get a guy to do that full turn in a day, you were making like 1500 bucks on that truck, which at the time was fantastic, right? A lot of money in a day on a truck. And so I had a load and it delivered the next morning, like 7 a.m. I could not for the life of me get it covered for delivery. Our local people refused to do it. I didn't have any drivers available to do it. So what I do, just drop the thing. I was like, ah, oh, whatever, we'll fail that load. No big deal. I dropped it, had them on another load coming back. What I didn't know is that was a time sensitive load. Like it was very important that it made, right? No one said anything to me about that or anything. So the sales guy, um, We'll call him Mitch, and that was his name. But he, <laughs> he there's comes, no such thing as protecting the innocent <laughs> around here. He uh, he comes in, he's coming around. He's like, "Who dropped this load? Whose truck is this?" You know, because he didn't really know how to use the system, right? Sales guys. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so he finds out it's me, and so he comes to my desk, and he goes, "Did you drop my load?" And I said, "Yeah." He's like, "You didn't have it covered?" I said, Mm-mm, "No, I didn't." I said, "I I just couldn't find anybody." He grabs my tape dispenser, and he, he just yanks like this long piece of tape. He gets a piece of paper, and he kind of turns us back to the side to me, and he writes on it. And he goes, and he steps up onto my desk with both feet, so he's standing next to the <laughs> ceiling. He takes this tape. He sticks it up on the ceiling, so it's dangling, and this piece of paper is right in front of my face. It says, if you drop another one of my effing loads, I'll fire you. <laughs> right? scared the, and he had no authority to fire me, but I didn't know that. I was new there. Right. Uh, but it scared the crap out of me. Right. Like obviously a very bad example of how to treat somebody. You take that versus that same situation. Um, my direct manager, whose name was Aaron, great guy, uh, really his name, Aaron, obviously just cause he's a great guy. Uh, but Aaron, and it was the same guy that actually had that story I tell about making me sit back down and finish my work with the extreme yeah. ownership. Aaron sits me down and says, listen, Jeff, great idea. You had the right presence of mind on what you were trying to do, but you did it the wrong way. And then he took the time to show me, right, how to look further in and deeper to try and get loads covered, like reach out to other dispatchers to see if they had drivers that could do it. I mean, a bunch of different things, right? And he was like, you know, this is obviously a very important load. You need to do better, right? And that was, that was pretty much it. But he took the time to actually coach me, right, and speak that kind truth to me to show me what a better way to handle that was versus Mitch, who was just a total asshole. Yep. Yeah. Well, well I we think all, we've all worked with those people. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting you think about like the extreme ownership side of that, which if I was that manager in that case, is like clearly I didn't make this clear enough about why that load was important. You know, now maybe you were new. Well, then I didn't train you well enough, right? <laughs> they didn't train anybody well enough. <laughs> that was actually my first thought when you said that. It was, how did you even know? Right. How did you know important? that it was important or that it was a time sensitive or it something? It should have had some kind of a flag on it or a note or... But as the manager, that's like, yeah. you know what? That's my bad. I'll go deal with, you know, Mitch and uh, take the take on that one. But this is how we're going to do this in the future, yeah. right? So that's, that's good. Back in the late 90s, early 2000s to training with Knight, it was basically, here, sit with somebody for two hours and then take 60 trucks and have Good luck. Done. Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing anybody made well, any money you, back then. You know, that's a good point. That's why we do such a good, we try to do such a good board, onboarding here. Yeah, onboarding is critical. Because it's it's critical. I remember that, you know, it's a couple of jobs where they just throw you into the, the mix and say, there you go. You go, there you go, what? I don't even know who these people are yet. Right. Yeah. You know, so. So, Steve, you had a couple episodes, but what was your what was your first one that you said, yeah, this is one that I really enjoyed? I, I really had fun with the uh, culture fit is bullshit. I mean, we were basically talking about, um, something we saw on LinkedIn Yep. and uh, somebody was saying it's all crap. And of course for us, culture is everything. We put the cult in yeah. culture. That's yeah. What I like. And so, and I, and I really just, it, I just found that incredible that somebody would not think the culture was important. You know, it to me has seemed incredibly naive uh, and short sighted, especially in the environment we have right now where everybody's moving yep. like crazy. I mean, people are dropping out of cultures just for 10 cent raise an hour, you know, and, and with all the stuff that we're trying to get across and all the customers we're trying to get and the growth we're trying to do, to do in this company, 
you know, it's just, it just didn't resonate with me. And I, I just thought it was kind of an interesting way for us to, to kind of go through that and really take point by point and say, this is why we disagree with this, you know? Well, it's someone who, I mean, I don't know their background, but apparently they either hadn't had really good experiences with culture mm -hmm. or they've talked to people that didn't have good experiences with culture. And when you talk to people who are looking for jobs and employers and you hear culture fit a lot, right? It ends up being that they believe it's bullshit because is there really a good culture out there? Is there places that are going to, you know, do good for me and I can actually fit in where I'm not looking to jump to another job? You know, we don't know their experiences, but I mean, to say something like that was that general and that blanket, it wasn't really the best comment. You know, and I, and I understand a little bit. I mean, we just hired somebody that's uh, been talking to a little bit. And it's like, is this real? Yeah, this that, feel real. that's exactly what they say. Is, is this real? I mean, I'm too cynical. I mean, for this, I mean, could that somebody actually have a culture like that, that, you know, they really care about people and they really are empathetic and they really, you know, speak the kind truth and all the things that we, we, uh, you know, propose here. And, and, you know, I think people just, um, they can't believe it. And maybe this person, you know, and I'll give them, a, I'll assume positive intent, you know, maybe they just haven't been in a good culture yeah, or, or, Maybe like me, I've been in many bad cultures, and so now I know what a good culture is. Amen, brother. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's funny. You know, like you talk about maybe she just didn't understand, and that's yeah. one of my first reaction when I saw that too. Is you know, you keep saying culture fit, and the whole time I've got Diego Montoya from uh, Princess Bride <laughs> in my head. You know, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> and, uh, that's that's all I thought about when I, we were reading that. I'm like, hey, I, this is we're not talking about the same thing. We even had a conversation me and her you did. on LinkedIn, and I was like, uh, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. Oh no, we're talking about the same thing. Okay, you know, dig in your heels. <laughs> uh, so like, one of my favorites was it was early on. You know, it was uh, Leaders or Readers. And I think, Jeff, this was you and me. It was. Uh, talking about some of our favorite books that we've read. You know, Extreme Ownership and Five Dysfunctions of a Team were the two that we talked about in there. Uh, and for me, it was fun because it was really the first episode that we talked about just, it was a, its own topic, you know. And we'd been kind of leading up to that point talking about the four pillars of, of fleet success. And I thought those were really important that we set the foundation. But this is one where we kind of really just freewheeled it a little bit. We went out ad hoc and... It was just a lot of fun to kind of riff on things that we were really passionate and excited about and lessons that we've learned. Uh, it was. And here's what I'll say. Like, so we give books to people that are hired on. Yeah. So I just hired a couple SDRs and we gave them their books. Um, and one of them comes to me and goes, when am I supposed to read these or how, how, how long do I have? And I said, listen, if you need a break, go sit on the couch, read yep. the book for a little bit. I said, you've, you've got time to read them. I said, but you got to understand you need to take this and this is for your personal development, right? If we're taking the time to help you learn new things and new ways to do things, it benefits us as a company. And she just stopped and looked at me and said, wait, you're trying to make me better. Well, why wouldn't we make you better? Right. Right. You know, and I kind of referenced our episode leaders or readers where I said, go, go listen to one of our podcast episodes, leaders or readers. I said, you know, it's very important that you continue to gain knowledge as you go along, regardless of really the topic, because you're just going to be able to better yourself and how you treat other people and your job performance and everything else. Yep. You know, I wasn't on that podcast, but, uh, it made me, made me think about, uh, a question I was asked years ago. Somebody asked me, why have you been successful in life in the fleet industry? You know, and that was the first thing that came to my mind because I'm an avid reader. I love to read. I used to spend, you know, 10 to 15 minutes just looking at publications every day before I even got into my work. Yeah. You know, I read, you know, my wife gets mad at me because I got bookshelves full of these business <laughs> books, right? Yeah. That I've had all these years of my career. I've kept every one of my college books from bachelor's degree to master's. Oh, well, that's commitment. <laughs> and she said to me, what are you doing that for? They're, they're dated. They're old. I said, yeah, but there might be a nugget in there I want someday, you know. Some like, principles that yeah. just hold true, you know. Yeah. Accounting hasn't changed much in 50 yeah. years. But. So that that was kind of, the, you know, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, that that was, uh, to me, reading is the one thing that's made me successful in life. Do, they, they, it, do you guys mark up your books when yeah. you read them? Do you? So, I mean, well, yeah. it depends on if I, if I read it or if I'm listening to it, right? Because you can't mark up the audible. And I like the Audible because I drive in to and from work and I listen to it on my drives. But when I read a physical copy of a book, I typically like to highlight it 
and then make notes in the margin. Okay. Uh, John Maxwell had a really awesome quote. We read it on Trade Leadership last year. He talked about the first time that I read a book, the book, you know, I mark the book. The second time I read a book, the book marks me. And I thought that was really impactful. Is it, that he, you know, he went through and he talked about how he rereads the highlighted sections, and then that's when it really sinks in for him. You know, it's not enough just to read it the first time. Yeah, I lent someone one of my books that was all marked up, and they thought it was a weird thing that I marked it up. And I said, listen, if I'm thumbing through this book because I, I remembered, hey, there was a great quote or principle yep. in there, I want to be able to recognize it without reading the whole book all over again. Right. So let me highlight it, write something, and then I can just go right to those sections to find what I'm looking for. Yeah. I've actually put sticky notes in there and make tabs and write on the sticky notes and the margins. Yeah. And then I highlight and I underline. And, and so it, one of the things that I remember, and I think, it was either Ken Blanchard or uh, Ken Coleman. It was one of the Kens. They talked about this. And he talked about how the person you become, and we talk about personal development for this new SDR, but the person you become is a result or the product of the people that you meet and the books you read. You know, and if you look at yourself and you want to know, where am I going to be in five years? Just look around. Who are the people that you're associated with right now? And what books are you reading? And that's who you're going to be five years from now. You know, and that's honestly all it comes down to. So... Uh, Jeff, what was another one of your favorite? Uh, reigniting. No, not reigniting. Sorry. <laughs> conducting. That was a fun one. It but. was, but no, it's not mine. Conducting effective interviews. This is why this one was good for me because the first time I was a manager and I had to interview people, I've got zero direction. Like all I had to go off of is me being interviewed for jobs. And that was like McDonald's, right? Where they just wanted someone that had a pulse or when I got the job, um, at night, which was really just, uh, Hey, we need somebody come on in. You know, there wasn't <laughs> a real interview in my opinion. So having tips and advice for people out there on how to conduct an effective interview, I think goes a long way because a lot of people, they, you know, they've got their canned questions. So tell me your three strengths. Tell me your three weaknesses. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. You know, I mean, there's like those, those, but they're not necessarily the most effective ways to get to know somebody. Right. Right. Having a conversation with someone and getting to know them as a person is usually pretty effective as opposed to just trying to get rehearsed answers from them, which is what you get when you ask a lot of business-related questions. We're, uh, I'm actually speaking about this topic in a month at, uh, at Elite Entrepreneurs and talking about some of the things that we do that we mentioned on this episode, which are things like doing playing cards during the interview process. You know, as a way to kind of get past those rehearsed answers and break through some of the you know, the facade that you get from a candidate and how you just get the genuine real person, you know? And so it, it always throws them off a bit though, doesn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and you would think like they <laughs> finally learn, you know, if they've been listening to the podcast, of course, I mean, this is one episode out of 50, so good luck finding it, I guess. But <laughs> you know, if they'd heard that one, they'd know like, this is something we do, right? We yeah. play a card game as a way to just kind of decompress, make it more natural, get rid of the, you know, the, the rehearsed answers and settle down the nerves because it's intimidating. You know, we will pull in these SDRs and they're meeting with the VP of engineering and the CEO of the company, you know, and like you've never had that level of interview before. You can get yourself a little bit psyched up for it. And so the cards really helps with. with I look at it as kind of an in-between thing from where, I mean, I, I was in companies that did exactly what Jeff said. You just, if you could fog a mirror you're in, you'd ask a few stupid questions, you know, and, yeah. and then I've been in companies that are very high on the corporate end where they got a structured interview guide, a SIG, they call it. Yeah. And you go through this thing and it has all these, you know, situation tasks and all that stuff. And, and they're, they were good for guide as far as asking consistent questions to different people. Which is good. You need yeah. to be consistent. So, so that, that wasn't bad. But they were so structured that you didn't allow anybody to really shoot from the, the hip or give a direct answer that was genuine or... Well, there's no way to flow, right? Yeah. Like somebody gives you an answer and you're like, well, let, let's unpack that a little bit and dive deeper on yeah. that topic. So I like, I really like what we do here for that yeah. reason. Yeah. Go ahead, Josh. And we do have a, like a flow to ours, right? Like we've got steps, but within the steps, then we just kind of like, okay, well, here's some questions you should ask. We've got a whole question bank that you can pick from. Um, and then, you know, like, so there's like, it's trying to find that balance where it's, you know, there's enough structure and material to use uh, but then it's up to us as managers that if whoever's running lead on that, that we've coached them and taught them how to do it. Uh, we've been doing uh, some several interviews lately, and I've been including some of the frontline employees in that so that they can learn how to conduct proper interviews. And they can watch and be a part of it and understand what it's like to be on this side of the table 
instead of as the candidate. And I think that's important too, to involve coworkers yeah. or people that could be working for the person you're hiring yep. so they can get a kind of a feel for them as well. Yep. You know? and, and they have a say on the process right. to some extent, you know. Yeah. Uh, all I was going to say earlier when you were talking was, you know, when you have a SIG that you have these questions you have to follow, most of your relevant data comes from your follow-up questions and really unpacking what yep. someone has said. If you've got these questions that you have to follow, you're not going to be able to do that and ask those questions and then actually get into a flow and dig down and see what they mean or how they react to certain things. So it's very, very important. Well, because people think the questions are more important than the interview. Yes. Right. Yep. And so you, you don't want to not ask a question, right? Oh my gosh, I'm going to get trouble. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, and I chuckle at that because, you know, sometimes we're guilty of uh, the card game becomes more important than the interview. <laughs> we we're we're so competitive. We're we wrapped up in that card game. We're like, <laughs> whose turn is it? Who laid down those threes? Who played? <laughs> so, um, Steve, your second episode that you really enjoyed doing. Um, the Gossip. Uh, you know, I took my glasses off, so I'm going to have to read this now. But the enemy of unity. Um, I don't know how many organizations I've been to that uh, most everyone has gossip. Yeah. You know, and the fact that we actually care and try to eliminate that in our culture is just a, it's an amazing feat. It's not always possible. But uh, the fact that we focus on it, to me, is uh, it's imperative that we do that. You know, and I... I wish that uh, other people and other organizations that I worked in before could really have thought about that yeah. more. Well, not just uh, not just like talk about it, but address it when it happens. Right. That's that's the most important part of it all. Is is you know addressing it, and a lot of people don't do that. Oh, we don't have gossip, and then someone gossips, and it's just like, okay, well, I guess we do. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, and that goes back to our favorite saying, which is, "It's not about what you preach; it's about what you tolerate." Yep. Right. And so we could get up there and. And that was early on, you know, I, I'd get up and talk about, hey, no gossip, no gossip, but nobody really believed it. And until people started, you know, like a couple of people lost their jobs, not because of the gossip, but because gossip and other other things that were tied back to the gossip, right? Um, and then you start, oh, they're like, they're serious about this, right? Or we start having, we just start addressing it immediately. Oh, oh, oh. I heard that chatter and we're going to talk about that right now, you know, like in my office, let's go. Uh, let's well, you have know, that conversation. The thing I didn't really think about much, I mean, it makes so much sense, but it, what resonated with me about the gossip was if you're gossiping to somebody that can't do anything about it, yep. you know, then you're just wasting your time. You're venting and then you got to drag somebody into a conversation and maybe affected their behavior, their attitude. Yeah. Well, you should have went to the person in the first place that could actually do something about it, yeah. which is really a no brainer. But, you know, if you think about it in that context, but most people don't think about that. No, they, they'd rather think just about, they're frustrated, about it, right? right? They're frustrated and they just want to go vent to whoever. Well, I think there's also people that have the low self-esteem. Yeah. So to build themselves up, they'd much rather talk negative about someone else to make yeah. themselves feel better. Yeah. I will say it's been really refreshing to see, you know, especially as we've brought in, you know, what, 12, 13 new hires, uh, as we've hired for that culture fit. Like this has been one of those things that I've actually seen decrease significantly over the last several years um, you know as we've kind of changed the blood out and gotten some new transfusion and uh, it's been it's been really rewarding to see that it's you know it's like self-policing now where we're not as managers having to police this and it's like self-reinforced within the company the organism is building up its own defenses against gossip and so anytime that uh, you know, somebody on the front line hears somebody else gossiping, like they're saying something now Yep. and they're like, Hey, 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 you know, well, why don't you go talk to them about that? Like, I'm not here for that. I can't we don't even, do that here. You I know? can't even honestly, can't even think of the last time somebody came to me with any kind of gossip. Well, hopefully your direct reports were coming to you. Well, but, but I mean, that, that just malicious gossip. I haven't heard anything for right. a while. And I haven't heard it. Like since yeah. that last time we addressed it, when I heard yeah. it outside my office. Yeah. Nothing. Right. Well, now they know not to do it by your office. That's right. right. Now, now they go outside. Now they do it in the break room, the, the back, you know. But now for the, for the most part, like it has been really nice to tramp it out. Uh, so my last one was the one we just recently did, Reigniting the Fire. Uh, if, you know, like for me, that was fun for two reasons. One, it was fun because we were talking about something really relevant to us uh, that I know a lot of us have dealt with, you know, burnout and things like that. Uh, we're talking about employer attention and how important it is to, touch into or tap into like somebody's higher sense of purpose. Uh, but I'll be honest, I think my favorite thing was just singing Righteous Brothers at the end. Like that was uh, definitely a, a highlight for uh, for the podcast in year one. 
I think our listeners are probably glad I didn't join you on that one. Yeah, maybe I think they're a little bit sad that uh, that we even did it. But. Right. <laughs> they wish Josh did a solo. <laughs> so, uh, but that was definitely a lot of fun, you know. And I, I think that's as I look back, that's what I've enjoyed the most is just kind of the, you know, the ad hoc nature of how we discuss things and how like these are really relevant topics. You know, of all of our topics, I was noticing this really didn't talk a lot about fleet you know and it, it makes me it's sad on one side but i think it's because it's so relevant right like the culture side of the fleet business is the one side that nobody's been talking about and it's the most neglected and it's kind of why we started this whole message right it was we've got to get culture out first and foremost you know and talk about stakeholder satisfaction culture and then let's talk about resource efficiency and risk management because those have been addressed so well in the past they're really important but you know, like we need to start talking more about culture than we have and make it equal with those other two pillars. I mean, I, there's a couple I liked, but they were just down there from the culture. I mean, I, I like preventive maintenance when we did the preventive maintenance. I like the standard repair time. I was just going to say that standard repair yeah. times. and but, but ultimately, I mean, you can't get good standard repair times or do good PMs unless your culture is yep. where it needs to be. Well, it, what it really boils down to. It comes back to that. I just posted a quote on LinkedIn from Doc Rivers talking about the Phoenix Suns. Yeah. And basically what Doc Rivers said is Monty Williams came in and the first thing that he did was he fixed the culture. Yep. And now that the culture's fixed, look what has followed. And then the wins, yep. right? Like they fix the culture and then they fix the wins. And that, when I look at organizational health, right, this is one of my things when I read The Advantage. That's his whole message in that book is that organizational health trumps everything else, you know, you can be a very smart and good organization, but if you don't have a healthy organization, it will rot from the inside and it won't last. And so a healthy organization paired, like it forces itself be to become smarter. And so I think that's why we resonated so much on these like, hey, culture, 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 um, because we really are like almost the fleet culture people. Well, and we have so much experience and like I could tell stories all day long about bad stuff that's yep. happened, right? Or things that have shaped me. And it all revolves around how people have treated you and how they've acted and where you've been. And, and I'm sure you guys are the same way. So it's very, very prevalent. Yeah. You know, I, I even think back you know, when I was, I mean, I coached Little League for 12 straight years because I have five sons. The first thing I worked on was culture. I didn't really think, think about it then. But as I look back now, after we're doing all this, I'm going, you know, that's exactly what I was doing. Yeah. Is I had to have the right culture, the right kids in the right spot. I had to keep the gossip down. I had to get people working together as a single team. And and I spent so much time on that in practice. Yeah. You know, working on the one that maybe was not contributing as much as the others because you're only as good as your weakest link. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, that's really what it comes down to on any team, any organization, culture is paramount. Yep. So I think it's been fun for us. It's trade show season right now. And, you know, as Jeff mentioned, like you, you were out at a bunch of trade shows last week. We've, uh, we were at NTA a few weeks ago. Um, one of the fun things has been, you know, as we've been asked to speak at some of these events, we've been able to take this message of fleet success, talking about the four pillars and the response that we're getting on the trade show floor after having these sessions, it kind of tells us like, no, they're, the message is resonating. Like there's something for people in this message. Um, and I want to just reinforce that with the listeners is like, hey, you guys are just as much a part of this as we are. I mean, we're the we're on the podcast, sure, and you know, like we've got the the pillars and we keep talking about them. But you know, it's just as much for you if this is resonating with you. Share it with your peers, and you don't need to even mention us. Just talk about your own experiences with implementing, you know, better hiring practices or trying to establish your own culture. Um, you know, like it's it's kind of it's on you as well to gather people to the flock, so to speak. Uh, you know, if this is resonating with you, it's going to resonate with others. So don't be afraid to share that message. You know, um, I would love to hear from our listeners as well. Like if they've got favorite podcast episodes, um, you know, send those in. I'd love to hear which ones have been your favorite, which topics you've just enjoyed us talking about. Uh, if there was a fleet specific one that you really enjoyed. Um, but Jeff, as we've gone through the trade shows, what are some of the messages or things that, you know, people have come up to you and said, Hey, we really enjoyed this about, you know, like your, your sessions last week. It's really a talking about a different way of thinking about things, right? So, you know, you start off our, my presentation talking about stakeholder satisfaction and you talk about the different tiers and people don't consider much outside of, especially in the trucking world, yeah. outside of their customer. 
right? So it's a different way to look at it. I, the, the biggest one is the intentional culture. So I had a bunch of people that were just single truck operators that after I spoke, they came and were talking about they'd never thought how important culture was, but they are going to try to do things a little differently with the brokers that they deal with, or even their spouses who may be their dispatcher, right? Find their loads from or whatever else, because they realize that, you know, giving the attitude or just, you know, being short fused or frustrated or whatever else doesn't do any good for anybody. And it puts a lot of animosity in that. Um, you know, they, cause trucking is simple, right? But when you, when you spread it out and you talk about the different things that can affect it for the positive, it really opens people's minds and then they can like think about experiences that they've had in their life and they relate it to what we're talking about and saying, like I had a guy that asked me, you know, about, and I'm not a financial guy, but asked me about a PL. Like, how do I read a PL? I don't understand like how to get my finances. He's only got four trucks, right? right? But he's got a bookkeeper who basically just sends him a bunch of garbage and he didn't understand. I said, well, I'll tell you what, I've got a sample PL for you. Let me send it to you. I sent it to him this morning and he replied back to you. I appreciate you doing this, right? Your message was great. I still love to come to your guys' summit. So, I mean, there's a lot of, you know what I'm saying? There's a lot of people who just, they haven't thought about it this way. Right. And, and by engaging that new train of thought, right, you are getting more people that are jumping on board to what we're trying to do. That's what I actually love about our industry is everybody's willingness to step up and share and to help. And, you know, I mean, the, it's such a collegial atmosphere in fleet. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, we had a guy, that. you know, that came and talked to us. Um, oh, gosh, I want to say his name is Micah, but it's not Micah. But we, you know, we went and talked to him. He was at the uh, NTEA. You know, he's got a, a small little, you know, waste collection company, sanitation company that he's growing. And, you know, like you were in the waste industry at one of the biggest right. waste providers in the world. And it's just like, oh, yeah, no, I've got tons of stuff I can share with you. You know, there's tons of things that we can give and, and help you as you're on your way up, you know. You know, what's funny about that is I, I've saved so many things during my career that I've created. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, I'm, I'm happy to share that kind of stuff because I, you know, that's how I learned, you know, somebody mentored me or shared things with me that I didn't know. And, you know, and now that I'm getting closer to retirement in the next few years or so, that's the most fun I have is meeting with people and sharing stuff. Yeah. And I think that's the, like the, the final message I'll leave with on our 50th episode is like, why are we doing this? Cause Jeff just got that question the other day. Well, why are you putting on a show and not talking about yourselves? Because it really is about the message, right? Like I, you know, it, it's not about religion, but it's essentially like creating this religion within fleet. Um, you know, after, when you think about going to like New Testament times, right? After Christ died, what did all the apostles do? They went out and evangelized. And it's, you know, why? Because they firmly believed in what they were taught and they wanted to share it with the world. And I think that same thing has happened here. Like, why am I doing this? Well, it's because I was taught from all these great authors, you know, Jocko and Patrick Lencioni. And, and I wanted to take that and evangelize it into my industry. And it resonated with you guys. And like, you know, we're like the three apostles of fleet Fleet success. success. (laughs) And, and I want everybody that's listening, like you guys are in that same thing, right? You are the missionaries, you are, you know, our fellow apostles and you're taking that, you're the evangelists. Um, And just as much as I know, we love to share resources and things like that. Uh, you know, as we're sharing things around culture and uh, the things that we've learned from the podcast, we've got a book coming out. Uh, you know, it's not the, it's not the book of Josh or anything like that. It's just the fleet success playbook. And so sharing that with, uh, with people, um, you know, we've got the fleet success summit coming up, which is going to be an amazing show. There's going to be so many takeaways from that. Like, I can't tell you how excited I am to listen to people like Patty and Paul, uh, to listen to Mike Pitcher and Brett. You know, like these are people that I've always listened to, but now I get to, like, it's my own personal stage. If you want to think of it that way, um, you know, they just have a message that uh, that resonates with everybody in Fleet. I'm excited about Kristen because that's something I really hadn't really thought about before. You've got uh, Kristen, Sam, yeah. Brett. Like these are people that would have never you'd never hear from these guys at NAFA or GFX or any of these shows yep. because it's just not their typical industry, right? Like they're not going to get. GFX isn't going to reach out to Kristen and say, hey, come on in and, and come talk to us. They might get one uh, of those kind of speakers, right? But we've got three or four. Yep. And then and then we bring in Fleet. And then we bring And so that's the kind of thing is like we're taking a message that hasn't been brought to Fleet before, and that's what we're doing. Uh, so the more that we can get other people on the bandwagon, you know, it's not about us. Like there's no branding at the Fleet Success Summit about RTA. It's just the Fleet Success Summit. 
Uh, I, I envision, I was telling somebody else, like one day I see this becoming a, a huge show where you can't tell who started this thing. And if that happens, that means that we've been truly successful. If you can't tell that RTA was it, and we want to be the voice of fleet success, right? Like we, you know, we want to kind of be at the forefront when you think about it, it's synonymous. But if I were to ask you, you know, well, who started the word customer success? Well, I don't know. Like HubSpot's gotten really good at preaching that, but they didn't start it. Well, who started it? Well, it was this guy over at Gainsight who kind of created it, but I only know that because he wrote this book and he talked about, you know, uh, category creation. But like there's, if we can get to that point with this where people are like, oh, I don't know, I've just heard about this fleet success thing and I heard about it from so-and-so who heard about it from so-and-so, you don't know where it started. Uh, I think that'll be an awesome day. So uh, that's going to do it for us today. And as a reminder, we got the Fleet Success Summit coming up April 20th, 21st out here in Mesa, Arizona. Uh, schedule's all up to date. We've got the uh, updated links with all the speakers. So if you're curious about who's speaking, when they're speaking, uh, that's all on the website at fleetsuccesssummit.com. Uh, be sure to tell your friends and coworkers. Uh, you can enter the code podcast if you want to get a discount on your registration. And we will see you next week evangelize yeah i look forward to seeing it at the summit thanks for joining us on this episode of the fleet success show if you liked our show we'd appreciate your five-star review be sure to subscribe anywhere you listen to podcasts and come hang out with us anywhere on social media at fleet success see you next time